Greetings on this blessed Sabbath day. We, the members of the Bilson SDA Church, would like to welcome everyone to our service. And no matter the device you are using, we are honored by your presence. If this is your first visit, we hope you will come again. As we worship together, we pray that we will all be richly blessed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. To begin our service, we will start by the use of the song 272, Give Me the Bible. now time for the scripture reading. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. The scripture Sabbath. reading taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 10 and 11. And it says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. Amen. We thank you for that. It is now time for us to uh, bow reverently. Um, so as you do, uh, I will be leading out in the intercessory prayer. So if we bow our heads, please. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for sparing our lives that we are able to see yet another Sabbath day. Father, you have taken us through another week of toil and labor, and uh, we give you the praise that we have been able to see it through. Lord, we ask that you will 
Guard our hearts and our minds away from temptation and our natural desires um, to please ourself. We ask you, dear Father, to give us more and more of a desire to serve you in all things. Continue to inspire and direct our steps. Help us to be Christ-like in all things. Help us also, dear Lord, to see the need in others and to be your instrument to supply their needs where we can. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for those who are sick and in need. We ask, dear Lord, that you will tend to their emotional, physical, and their spiritual needs. I also pray, dear Father, that you will be with uh, the many categories of uh, people uh, gathered here to, to worship you. We pray for the young people. We pray for our senior members and uh, those in between. Father, you see and know each and every one of us by name. You see and know our hearts and our desires. And Lord, we pray, dear Lord, that um, as we draw closer to you, and that you are able to mold us and to shape us and to use us for your will. Lord, we uh, hold up to you the leaders of our church, the leaders of the conference and the world leaders, dear Father. We know that the whole world is your creation. And I ask that the decisions that are being made uh, that they, your hand will be at work in all things. Help us as a people to live by faith and not by sight. So Lord, we ask that you will forgive us and present us uh, clean and faultless before your throne. And these mercies we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And we have the children's story. I just invite the children. Good morning, children. If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. If you go to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. And what we're looking at here is what God actually did with his word. You see, for all of the children and, and, and those watching, I want to encourage all of you that God, via his word, was able to create everything that we have around us today. Stories of the Bible Creation In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was empty, formless, and dark. But the Spirit of God was there. On the first day, God said, Let there be light. And God saw that the light was good, then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. On the second day, God said, let there be a space to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. God called the space sky. On the third day, God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so dry ground may appear. God called the dry ground land and the waters seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land sprout with every sort of plant and tree, and God saw that it was good. On the fourth day, God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. God made two great lights, the sun for the day and the moon for the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, and God saw that it was good. On the fifth day, God said, let the water swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind, and God saw that it was good. On the sixth day, God said, let the earth make every sort of animal. God made all sorts of wild animals, 
livestock, and small animals, each able to have babies of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, to be like us. So God created man in his own image. He formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man, and a man became alive. Then he saw that the man needed a helper, so God put man into a deep sleep. And while he slept, God took one of the man's ribs. Then God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. Hello. Hi. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and rule over it. Rule over the fish in the sea. Hello, Hello. The birds in the sky. Hello, bird. And all the animals that scurry along the ground. <laughs> then God said, Look, I have given you every plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given you every green plant as food for all the animals. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was done. So on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and said it was holy. Just in closing to the children's story, the, um, there's something that I want all of the children to think about. On the first three days of creation, God created a place that needed to be filled by something. So on the first day of creation, God created a space where it was, there was the light and the darkness. Uh, then on the second day of creation, we read about the waters and them being separated and the heavens above from the waters beneath. On the third day, the land appeared. And all of those spaces that God created, he then began to fill. So on the fourth day, he filled the space where it was light and dark with the sun and the moon and the stars. On the, the fifth day, he filled the space that had waters and heavens with the fish and the birds. And on the sixth day, he filled the land with the animals and then with man and woman. And then on the seventh day, we have the Sabbath where God wants everything to come together to be blessed by his presence. The point I want to make is that when we look at this in a spiritual figurative way, all of you children that are listening, God has created a space in your heart that he wants to fill and he shows us this principle in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and he wants you by your heart being filled by his presence you will then be able to have true rest so I just want to share that with you all and I'll say a prayer for you all right now let's pray dear Lord we thank you so much for the children we thank you so much that we have these opportunities to understand more about your truth in some stories that we read in the Bible that oftentimes we can overlook because they seem so simple. But we also see in there that in those stories, there's a profound truth that, that the children here today can accept. Ultimately, Lord, the world was created by your word. And today, as we look at the power of your word, I pray that the children uh, that are listening will be able to take hold of the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Our speaker today is uh, Elder Gooden. You've just heard him giving the final bit to the children's story. And Elder Gooden is our Bible worker and he's a man of God. And I believe he's a man with one wife. And so, <laughs> and so you know, we we know that he trusts in the Lord and he allows the Lord to lead and to guide him. And, you know, we know that the Lord has got a message for us. And therefore, before we hear Elder Gooden, we have got a meditational song. After this, Elder Gooden will deliver God's message to us. Thank you. The song is presented by one of the choirs in our sister churches in Uganda.
you've all had a blessed week so far um again we're still here church is locked down but we're on zoom and it's still a privilege to be able to come together to worship him um today the title of my sermon is the power of the word i pray that it will be clear for everybody and that you'll all be able to understand as we just take a look at the bible and ultimately the difference between the words of god and the words of men now, I do want to say, Elder Griffiths, I know you said you believe I'm the husband of one wife. My, my wife is here with us, um, so you'll see her there downstairs. She's um, doing some stuff with Israel and um, listening as well. So I just want to, my family is with us today. And we say thank you. God bless. There's a little man doing this thing. Um, so, yeah, uh, I bring greetings from the family to you all. Now, today, as we look at the, the power of the word, I'll just ask you to pray with me before we begin. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege of prayer, for the privilege of study, for the privilege to read your word, and for the opportunity to enjoy the Sabbath blessings uh, that we have, that you promised us from the beginning of creation. So as we take hold of those blessings, we know that on this day that we're um, set apart, it's a day set apart and made holy for you. And um, anybody who participates in this is joining in with you on this day that you've set apart for us. So we thank you for this, Lord. Please let the words that I say be clear and easy to be understood by all who are watching now on Zoom and also online. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Now, for those of you who may not know, the Bible is actually the world's most fascinating book. Um, it's actually sold more than not 1 billion, not 2 billion, 3 billion or 4 billion. It's sold more than 5 billion copies. It's been translated into more than 
hundred languages um, with as many as 40 authors who all differed in their culture, their education, their personality, and even their intellectual perception. Now, the book itself, this book, the Bible, um, was written through, throughout a period of more than 1,500 years and over the three continents of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Um, it's covered so many different subjects, and that's why I love about the book, um, this holy book, this special book, the Holy Scriptures. Um, it covers human experience um, in, in areas of history, prophecies, romances, drama, tragedies, and much, much more. Anything that you like to read normally, you can find those topics in the Bible. They're all there. And that's why I'm presenting to you today this book, the Bible. And we want to talk about the power that's actually in this book itself. You see, the name Bible comes from the Greek word, which is called biblos. It simply means book. Now, while it means book, the Bible is actually a small library because it contains 66 smaller books within it. We've got those sections split off into two. So you've got the Old Testament and then you've got the New Testament. An unknown author actually wrote about the Bible. They said that this book contains the mind of God himself. It shows the state of man and the way of salvation. And I do have to agree with that author. This book is amazing. It, it's literally alive. And that's what the Bible actually says of itself in Hebrews chapter 4. It says that the word of God is quick. Or in other words, it's alive. All right. Now, in all of its verses, its chapters, its books, the power is not actually found in the paper that we have here or in the ink. The power is found in all of its words. And you can only realize that power if you put your faith in the source of those words and that source being God himself. Now, when I say put faith in those words, each of us as humans, as individuals, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we put faith in things, in people, um, and in God, ultimately, if we choose to. Faith is simply a medium by which truth or error finds a lodging place in the mind. Um, those of you that are at university or at college or maybe working, people present things to you and you put your faith in their words or you choose not to put your faith in their words the truths or the errors that they teach you simply accept by faith if, if, if you believe those things so for example the person who believes in the evolution theory presented by Charles Darwin has simply put faith in his words and faith for them is simply the medium by which they've accepted his words as truth God says that he wants you to put your faith in his words and accept that his words are true. Now, when we do that, that's when we begin to realize and see the power of God. Now, years ago, myself, I decided to put my faith in God and his words. And I've learned over time to trust that what his word says, it can do. I've seen it happen in my own life. I've seen it happen in the lives of others. I've seen some amazing things. I've seen some shocking things happen when the word of God has taken place. I've seen grown men break down who, who have, 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 have acted out a tough exterior. But once the word of God entered into their hearts, they've changed. I've seen people who have been afflicted by Satan himself being set free by the very word and by prayer itself. So to, to, to read his word, it's not just a book. These words, when acted out in your life, make a decided change, a difference for you as an individual, um, the words of God in the Bible, God, God actually says his words are like a seed. Now, I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of Luke. We're going to go over to the book of Luke. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, New Testament. Um, as, as we're online, I'll be explaining how to get to some books if we are turning there, just for those who may be watching for the first time who may not be well acquainted with the book. So the book of Luke is in the New Testament. And it comes after the book of Matthew, Mark, and then you'll end up in the book of Luke. They call it the third synoptic gospel in the, the, the four gospels, the first four books of the New Testament. And as we go to Luke chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus is, is giving a parable. 
And in verse 11, he says, now the parable is this. And then he says, the seed is the word of God. And those by the wayside, because he was talking about seeds that were sent over. Some seeds were planted in the soil. Some seeds ended up on the wayside. Some seeds ended up and were choked by the, um, the thorns. And what he's explaining is that as you receive the word of God, there are situations which can be around you that hinder you from accepting those words as truth. And I just want to encourage all of you that may be watching right now. God, through his word, wants you to not be distracted by the things around you, but to come to him in total confidence, trusting that he is the way, the truth and the life, as Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 14 and verse six. Now, speaking of God's word as a seed. We all know that when you have a seed, what you're supposed to do with it is plant it. God is saying that he wants his seed, his word, to be planted in the soil of your mind. In each seed that you have, um, when if, if there's a, a seed for an oak tree, the mighty oak tree, but when you see the seed, it's small. Now, in that seed is contained... The end result that we would hope to see in the mighty tree. Any tree or any plant that you find in a seed, you'll, you'll go to the shops and you'll see packets of seeds that show you pictures of what they should look like when they're planted and when they're fully grown. So every seed, when you have it, you have, a, you have an idea of what you want it to become. God's word being seed, when it's planted into your mind, God has an idea. He has a... Uh, a picture in his word of what he wants you to become when that seed begins to grow in your life. In fact, there's two things that God wants you to recognize in accepting his word as truth. He wants you to recognize one, his promises, and two, his commands. Listen to this quote that's taken from a book called Christ's Object Lessons. You can get that book for free online. Um, I think you may even be able to find it as a PDF. But the book Christ Objects Lessons says this. The word of God is the seed. Every seed has in itself a germinating principle. And it, the life plant, is enfolded. So there is life in God's word. Christ says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And that's said from John 6 verse 63. He goes on to say, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. John 5 verse 24. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power, the very life of God by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. He who by faith receives the word is receiving the very life and character of God. Now, today, we're here in 2020, we're bombarded by films and music and people's conversations, the pandemic, situations that are breaking us up, um, social distancing, trapped in your home, but we're still able to worship. And at times you may be wondering, how can I live this life of God? How can I experience the life of God? There are many times I've spoken to many Christians who have said that they believe in God, but they're devoid and they're, they're not experiencing his power or his life. And I've often asked the question, how is it that we're not experiencing his life? And I've concluded that it is possible that even Christians do not realize that the two areas they need to look for to experience power from God's word are simply in his promises and in his commands. Now, I could say to you all now, Tell me some of the promises that you know in God's word. In fact, I'll invite you while you're watching to write down some of the scriptures that you know, which are promises of God's word. For example, a promise that I can think of right now is John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is a promise. So if I read that quote correctly, when I hear that promise, I can actually see that promise realized in my life. Another one that comes to mind is taken from the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, where God says that he will make a way of escape for you, even with 
the temptation that you're going through. So there's another promise. Um, I, I think of Philippians 4.13, where God says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is another promise. Now, what God's saying is that if I accept those promises, the power of his word is that I can see those promises fulfilled in my life. I can realize it. I can see that happen. And when I see that happen, I'm experiencing the very life and the very power of God. Okay. Then there's the commands. You know, there are, we, we, we often speak of the Ten Commandments that we read from Exodus chapter 20. Um, and we're experiencing and seeing fulfilled the command today of keeping his Sabbath day holy. But we also see that God says, don't steal, don't lie, etc. So as we see those commands, God says, look, I'll give you the power so that you don't have to lie and that you don't have to steal. But I'll also give you the power to tell the truth and to give to others instead of taking from others. There are other commands in the Bible. We have been commanded in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, to go to the whole world and share the gospel. God says, I have commanded you to do this. So in these commands, we can see the promises of God and his commands fulfilled in our lives today. He will give us the power to speak the gospel. He'll give us the power to be obedient to his truth. And that's what I love about his word. God's word truly is the incorruptible seed and when it's planted into your mind, when you accept its words and its source by faith, you will be able to experience its power and you'll be able to see his promises and his commands fulfilled. Now, God, the word of God, as we've said, has power to give you a new life and a new character. You can begin to reveal the life of God in your own experience. What makes up your character are, are two things. Your thoughts and your feelings combined make up the moral character of humanity. So you, what are your thoughts right now? Your thoughts may be good, your thoughts may be bad. What, what, um, what are your feelings right now? How are you feeling right now? Write that down. Write those points down. And if those thoughts and those feelings are good, well, praise God. But if they're not so good, then I'd invite you to take that to God in prayer and say, Look, why am I thinking like this? Or why am I feeling like this? Because those thoughts and feelings, when they're combined, they make up your character. Now, I've found God's word itself to be his voice to my very own soul. It changed me. I've seen it change people. My own life is testimony to the power of God's word. I remember the time when I was going to get baptized in the year 2000. And people who I told that I was going to get baptized were shocked. Some people came to my baptism and told me, I'm coming just to make sure you go in the pool. I'm coming because I don't believe that you're giving your life to God. I, I, I was a very bad character outside of God. But when God took me, he changed me. And those people did come to the baptism. They did see a change. And I'm praising God that I'm still here with him. But the walk isn't always easy. There are times when that self wants to rise up within me. And I have to just trust that every day I'm able to die to self. And live to Christ. But we see uh, what people say in their words. We, we hear the words of people and we read the words of God. One thing that we need to consider is one, God's word has power in it. So when we looked in Genesis, when God spoke, all of those things were made because his word started doing it. As we were reading, I'd invite you to go back to Isaiah chapter 55. And we're going to look at just verse 11 this time. God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I think that's amazing because that means that when God speaks, his word alone does the work. God's word has self-contained power. So when he, he said, let there be birds, and, and a vast array of birds came out, when we see those birds, we see what God's desire was that was contained in the word. Now, when we look at Genesis chapter 1, when God spoke and said, let there be light, boom, the light just appeared. 
um, it, he was able to separate it from the darkness. When he said, let the waters be gathered, he didn't need to put a dam in the earth. The waters just started gathering into one place. When God said, let the stars and the sun and the moon and all of those things appear, the greater light and the lesser light, they just appeared. When he called forth for the birds and the fish and the mammals on the land, they just appeared. The only thing that God came down to form with his own hands was man. And then he formed a woman from his rib. Now, so we see that his word is able to do what God says and it can do it in and of itself. But what about the words of man versus the words of God? Is it possible that the words of man contain power in and of themselves? And that's what we want to try and look at right now. Um, so firstly, as we've gone over Isaiah 55 verse 10 to 11, it's quite clear that God has said that his very own words accomplish, succeed, and achieve what he desires those words to do. As rain has its effect on the soil and causes the seed to grow, the word of God also has its effect on the heart of the receiver. The question is, Will you allow God's word to have its effect on your heart? In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul wrote about receiving God's word. He said, for this reason, we thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So it's possible for us to share God's words with others. So it becomes clear that when we receive by faith the word of God, it's able to effectively work in us and accomplish what God desires that word to do. Um, it's not for me to try and do for myself what only the word of God can do. A problem that we experience is that when we read a promise uh, from Psalms where it says, create in me a clean heart, Sometimes we try to create that clean heart in our own strength, when really we just need to allow God's word to do that work. So God says, as I've already read from that quote that we spoke about, by every command and every promise, we can realize and see fulfilled um, the promises and the commands of God. So everywhere that we're reading in God's word, you need to know and acknowledge that these words in and of themselves, when you put faith in the person who who spoke those words, those words have power to do what they say they can do. But with the words of men, unfortunately, we don't have that power. Our words in and of themselves do not have power to do what those words um, are. So, for example, if I have a cup right now and I say, be filled with water, that cup cannot go and just suddenly start being filled with water because my words don't have that power. Our words may express some of the simplest things. But for it to be accomplished, it is own, it's totally dependent on the man or the woman to do what is required or desired separate from the words that they say. So example, as I told you, if I, if I looked at a glass and I said, be filled with water, my words can't do that. I need to separately take the glass, turn the tap on and put some water in it. If I look at a seed and I say, grow, I have to take the seed, get some soil and put the seed in the plant in the soil to grow. That's not so with God. God can look at the plant and say, grow. He can say to that seed, grow. He could say to the fig tree, be withered. He could say to the seeds, be gathered into one place. And it would happen. We can't do that. Um, so that's the big difference with God's word and our words. So when comparing both words of men versus the words of God, there's a vast difference regarding self-contained power. Our words have no self-contained power. God's word, however, has self-contained power. So when he says he can do something for you, it is possible. God used men to write the Bible, and that doesn't take away from the power of the words. In fact, we read in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, it doesn't say some, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The word inspired in those verses actually means God breathed. Now consider this. In the book of Genesis, we read that when God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, Adam became a living soul. So when God's inspired, God-breathed words are received into my heart, I 
spiritually become alive, you spiritually become alive. These scriptures we take as inspired promises from God, but they were delivered by men, people like you and me. So have you ever received a gift that was delivered to you by a friend of your friend? I have. And there's, there's times when I've, I know somebody that may be going to visit my mama and I'll say, give my mama a hug from me. And they go there and they give my mama a hug. But that hug is not really why it's from them. The, the idea, the principle behind it is that that hug is from me. That's my hug. It's just come from somebody else. Um, if you received a gift from a friend of the friend, when I've received that, I was grateful for the person who brought the gift to me. But I was very grateful as well, as well for the person who sent the gift via the person. The Bible is a collection of God's words, promises, and commands that were delivered to us by individuals, kings, prophets, patriarchs, apostles, and much more who were all faithful to following God's will. And while I'm grateful to Paul and all of the other apostles and all of the other ones who delivered the, these words to us, I can't wait to see Jesus who sent the words to us by them. Can't wait to see him. I'm looking forward to seeing him. And the troubles that we're seeing in this world is telling me we're closer than ever before for his return. So when these individuals delivered, wrote or spoke these words, there was and then is on the part of the receiver an act of faith to receive those words as the words of God himself. So when you are going through a problem, when you're going through a struggle, something that you're, you're finding difficult in life, and if I come to you with a word and I let you know from Hebrews that God said he will never leave you nor forsake you. Though those words have the audibleness of my voice, my, my physical presence is there when those words are delivered. Those words are from God. He simply just used me to bring them. And then what God desires is that you put your faith in him, not in me, in him. In those words, and then you will see the power of those God, God's words fulfilled in your life. Um, and that's why Paul said again, and I repeat it, we thank God constantly for this. That when you received the word of God um, that you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it really is the word of God that works in you who are believers. Um, even prophecy, Second Peter 1 verse 19, Peter said, for prophecy came not. By the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So that means that we have the words of the Holy Spirit. We have the words of God himself in the scriptures for you. So don't just look at these words as they are on the page. This, God wants you to take these words and put them into your mind and live them. You know, we're not taking this book, this Bible to heaven. I've got several Bibles. You can see them in the background. I love Bibles. I love collecting them. But the thing is, these are going to burn. When, when Jesus is going to return and create the earth anew, all of this stuff is going to be destroyed. What won't be destroyed is what I've put in my mind. My father used to tell me all the time, education for him was a big thing. Coming from Jamaica and having to strive in England and do what he needed to do and master his, his career. He told me, what you put in, no man can take out. So study, read, and understand, because once it's in there, nobody can get it from you. I'm begging all of you, put these words into your minds. Start with one verse and just start memorizing the verse. Have it in the mind. Now, as I was speaking about the gift and, and us seeing those promises revealed, in closing, um, my wife for uh, my birthday, she she got me uh, a, a voucher to go and drive a supercar. It was a Ferrari Spider, uh, an amazing car. I, I love, ooh, if, if, bro, Clarence, I can see you nodding your head and smiling with me. Let me tell you something. You know, I saw the Lamborghinis going and you could just hear the clap of the, the clutch go down and the gear change. But I wanted the Ferrari. I've always wanted to drive one. And I sat down in the car. And I was, I was partly upset because the instructor's in there telling you what to do and hold the wheel. And, and I'm looking at him thinking, you think I don't know how to drive? But he's in there and he says to me, you know, 
just just put it from first to second, then third, then fourth. And as I'm going, it wasn't so much the time in the car that was great for me. It was the feeling of the speed of traveling a very long distance in a very short time. And you just hear the gears changing. And it's like you start from one place, you go down the straight, zoom, you're there. And it was, he looked at me and he said, it feels nice, doesn't it? And I said, yes, it does. And I was upset because I was only allowed to go around a few times. But the point being, the promise that I received in a gift from my wife, I realized by contacting the person who gave the gift, who, who was the one who um, provided the gift that my wife got for me. So while the gift contained the promise that I would be able to drive the car of my choice and partly my dreams, I had to contact the company to redeem the gift. I, I called and they fulfilled their promise, but it was my wife who gave me the gift. The company simply fulfilled it. To all of you who are watching, God has given you his promises. He's given you in here a gift. He simply delivered it by some other people. And what he says is he wants you to contact him. He wants you to come to him and redeem the gift. And I believe going up to heaven on a cloud with wings that will be crying holy, 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 and wheels that will be crying holy, 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 will be better and faster than any Ferrari I could ever drive. It will be more pleasant. It's going to be the best experience. And Clarence, I guess, look, everything that we have in this world today has been made from the earth and the things that God made. So maybe in heaven or in the new earth, we can put together and make a contraption that goes faster than a Ferrari and we'll present it to God and say, look, this is just for the fun of the saints. But before we get there, we need to accept him today. And my plea is that all of you who are watching will simply say to God, help me to read your words and to accept them. Help me to see your promises and your commands. Don't get confused about the power of God. The power of God's word is revealed in simply two places, his promises and in his commands. So I pray with you, look for the promises, look for the commands and see how God will fulfill them for you. I'd like to offer a word of prayer and then I'll close my message today. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for these truths. I thank you so much for these words. We thank you for your promises and we thank you for your commands. Whilst they're not always easy to accept because we can sometimes get distracted by the things around us, one thing is for sure, in you we can trust. So as we put our trust in you and as we pray to you, help us to realize three things. Your answers will always be yes, no, or wait. But we know the one thing that we can do is that if we come to you and pray to you in the mind that Jesus has shown us, according to your word, that every promise you've said there, we can experience. So we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Be with us through the rest of this Sabbath day. We thank you again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 God bless you all. Amen. 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 Just to say, amen. 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 Didn't our heart burn within us as we listened to that message? I don't think anyone, whether we're on Zoom or on YouTube, will listen and did not feel the presence of God coming through. And Elder Gooden, I'd like to thank you for allowing the Lord to use you today to bring across to us that his word is still powerful. Regardless of what situation we have got in our life, it is powerful. And, you know, God has used you today to help many of us. You may not know who they are, but God has helped you today to help somebody to make a decision to go back to the book and to read it. 
I so want to thank you very much for allowing the Lord to use you with his power to bring it across to us. Again, I'd like to, where is Sister Gooden? I could see her after I made the, the introduction, but she has now disappeared. So, past on my apology that I missed her in my introduction, please. And, uh, you know, we would like to see her more often as well. At this time, let us turn to the hymn 518. 518. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages and His grace is Glory in the highest sun shall and sing. Standing Thank you so much for your message to us today. Thank you for the way that you have brought it out to us, that each and every one of us could find something in this message for ourselves. And so, Lord, we ask that as we finish this part of the service, that your Holy Spirit will find room in our hearts where he can continue to speak to us, where we will feel the need to go back to your words and to find the promises and the assurances that you have given to us and that we will know for ourselves that there is power in your words. And therefore, Father, we ask that you will keep us and protect our minds from things that should not be there. Help us that our lives will begin to fall in line with your will. And so, Lord, we ask that you will guide us, not just for today, but always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Colonel the Gooden. And I can see Sister Gooden now, and I i like to say hello and welcome to Bilston one more time. So, you know, God bless and thank you. God bless. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.